The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. My guest right now is Robert Zimmerman. Now, Robert is an award-winning science fiction journalist and space historian who has written four books and numerous articles on science, engineering, and the history of space exploration and technology. His book, Genesis, the story of Apollo 11, describes the family and the political tale behind the first manned mission to another world, which he'll be sharing on the show. Hi, Robert. Hello. Hello, Kevin. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to have you on the show, Robert. Um, you do a lot of radio, and I think I may have heard of you on the Coast to Coast Network as well. Oh, yes, I've been on Coast to Coast uh, numerous times. In fact, uh, Kevin, I'm going to be on again tonight for two hours after your show. Uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, I like you there, and I like them. <laughs> well, uh, well, thank you for giving us the, the time today, because that, that, that's going to be late your time by the time you get on to Coast. So let's get straight into it then. Uh, the present state of manned space exploration and what the future holds. Um, well, you know, uh, Kevin, right now, I, I personally am more optimistic about the possibilities of the human race uh, colonizing and settling the solar system than I have in, oh, maybe 25 years. Um, I, I grew up during the 60s in the 60s space race. This was probably before your time. And uh, when uh, we landed on the moon in... Uh, in 1969, when the first astronauts landed on the moon, it, to that moment, it, I thought, and so did everyone of my generation at that time, thought that we would be colonizing the solar system, beginning that exploration in my lifetime. And the next 30-plus years, nothing much happened. Really, nothing much happened. The shuttle, American shuttle, go, went around the Earth basically many, many times, but in short hops. Um, you had a bunch of space stations built by the Russians and uh, Americans. Um, very little of that space station work really was focused in the right place uh, uh, because of politics. And so it's been very, very disappointing for the last few decades. But right now, I think it's the best it's possibly been because for the first time, we're beginning to see real private enterprise and competitive private companies and individuals developing their own rockets, spaceships, uh, technologies for getting people into space, and they're producing it in such a way that others, customers, can afford to buy it. And so rather than it being a government program, we're actually beginning to see space developed by the citizenry uh, the, of, of the world. And uh, today, in fact, today, this morning, uh, out in Mojave Desert in California, uh, 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 Richard Branson's company, Virgin Galactic, uh, they have been building Spaceship Two now for almost nine years. This is designed for space tourism. It's totally privately funded. Um, the design is based upon Spaceship One, which is what, which won the X Prize early in the, around 2003. But this is an upgraded, much larger ship, and it's designed to carry passengers, so it's got to be very robust and yep. comfortable. And today, they, they've been doing test flights, glide test flights of Spaceship Two. But today, they did their first powered flight and went supersonic on the very first one, and it was a complete success. And that means they're set to do uh, additional powered uh, flight tests and eventually get up to, uh, uh, up to uh, space, get up above 100 kilometers. Uh, 70 miles, and when they've done that, they'll be ready to start flying their passengers, and they've got several hundred people who've given them real cash to be tourists in space, to actually do a space flight. And so this is actually happening, and they aren't the only one, Kevin. You, uh, I could go on. There's uh, uh, SpaceX, which is a company built by a guy named Elon Musk. Uh, he was uh, uh, the guy who invented PayPal. 
He then made a billion and a half dollars, and he used that money to create a uh, space company. He's built a rocket, Falcon 9. He's built a Dragon capsule. He's privately built it. He's flown it twice to the International Space Station, selling the services to, the, to NASA to provide services to supplies to ISS. He's doing this. There's another company, Orbital Sciences. There's another company, x that's also building a, a suborbital craft, and they're building it. It's not just a dream. Um, uh, there is Strato Launch, another company. I could go on, Kevin. I mean, is, is, isn't this it? This is a very exciting it is. time right now. Isn't it incredible? I mean, who would have thought private enterprise would have been the ones, you know, on the forefront of, of the of the space race, in a sense? I mean, you, you well, know, well, I have to tell you that I grew up in the United States in the fifties, and I would have thought that would have been the. And Britain, too, United Kingdom, we are based on the concept. Adam Smith, private enterprise, freedom, free enterprise. And for the last 40 years, we actually have been copying the Soviet Union, and it doesn't work. And finally, it's, freedom is beginning to reign. Yes. And we're beginning to see creativity of individuals uh, take us to the stars. Do, do you think, though, that there's, um, there's money to be made out there? Oh, well, there's no question there's money. Richard Branson's no fool uh, with Virgin Galactic. This guy's made a fortune with Virgin Airway, Airlines and for his, for his uh, record company. Uh, he's no fool. He wouldn't be doing this if he couldn't make money on it. Then there have been numerous market surveys done just on space tourism alone. There's numerous surveys that have shown that wealthy people, when described how horrible the experience is to go into weightlessness and how dangerous it is, there are more than enough who are willing to commit billions of dollars for the opportunity to fly. Well, you mentioned and, a, uh, you I mentioned a figure no there. That. Plus, you've got governments. This is a role that governments do have. Governments, for a lot of national security and prestige reasons, want to be a, have a presence in space. Well, rather than build these things themselves, it's much more efficient and cheaper for, and better for their own nation to hire companies to do it. And so that's a customer they can hire. This is one of the things that's happened with SpaceX. SpaceX uh, is, is the builder of, the, of Dragon and Falcon 9. NASA is merely a customer. They buy the product. They don't build it. They don't design it. The government, they just simply buy it. And that's how the aviation industry was built in the 20s and 30s. The government merely bought the product. It didn't design it. And th- there's no question there's money to be made. Well, yes. People will get wealthy doing this, if you want to know. Well, you mentioned the, a figure of um, you know seven hundred uh, w- willing paying customers that have already signed up for uh, Branson's uh, s- uh, space flights. But when do they actually start? What what, what year would they would they um, launch? We're looking right now. They're saying that uh, they're going to be flying test flights of Spaceship Two through the end of this year increasingly higher, increasingly more powerful. They want to really feel the engine out. They want to make sure this spacecraft is robust and safe. They don't. The worst thing that can happen for them is the passengers die on a crash. Hmm. And so they're going to spend most of this year doing test flights. But they have scheduled their first passenger flights, they say, for early in the first quarter of 2014. Richard Branson and his family are on the manifest to go, the flight schedule to go on that flight. They're going to be the first passengers. And then they follow it up by flying the actual people who've given them money. Um, so this is happening. It's going to happen. It'll, it'll happen next year right now, unless something really disastrous goes wrong. And I am, I'm, I'm, you know, it's rocket science. Things can go wrong. Um, but uh, the company that's building this uh, spaceship, uh, Scaled Composites, um, uh, is a very careful and brilliant company, and they won't make. They're going to make sure it's going to be right, and I'm confident that by next year we're going to see passengers privately paying for the right to go into space. Um, there are companies following up on this, trying to make money. You know, you got the of communications course. industry yes. wants to get satellites and all. There's tons of money to be made here, and people recognize it. that's why these private enterprise people are getting involved. I mean, are we are we seeing the future shapes of of the the next sort of NASA evolution of its craft? Um, because obviously, you know, we're without well, that NASA's now without the uh, the the, the um, shuttles, aren't they? So so obviously they're looking at into for new over the horizon for what's going to be the next generation for them. Well, you see, NASA itself is just a customer. And the fact is that companies like SpaceX or Virgin Galactic are making their own spaceships. Yes. Now, they can fly NASA astronauts on it, if NASA wants to buy the product. They can fly other people on it. And uh, so 
in the end, to my mind, I don't really want NASA. I don't really want NASA in control. I want the government in control here because they slow things down. They prevent competition. Uh, they add bureaucracy, which slows everything down. I want, the, the, the freer we can make this, the better. Uh, one of the things about for decades, uh, Kevin, I've been asked this question on radio shows and television. Uh, what's going to happen with our space program? And my response always is, I don't want a space program. I want a free, robust, chaotic uh, uh, aerospace industry making it possible for many different people to get into space any way they want, for whatever purpose they want, in as myriad manner as possible. Because you get that kind of variety, not only do you get better innovation and competition, the costs go down, and everyone can follow their dream. That's really the way it should be. And that's what's really happening right now. It's interesting, too. Nations themselves are joining this competition, and they're feeling the heat. And the competition really is a good thing, because it makes everyone raise their level a little bit and do better work. It's yeah. really very exciting right now. Well, well, Robert, would that be your dream to go? Well, you know... 25 years ago, I would have said, without question, I, I, I do cave exploration, uh, Kevin, so I've actually had the joy of going where no one has ever gone before. I've actually had that, that ability, I've done that. I've found places that no human had ever been ever and been, explored them. I would love to have been able to fly. At this point, I'm getting a bit old, and uh, so <laughs> if the opportunity came, I would do it, uh, I think. Uh, but the opportunity is, uh, for me personally, getting less and less likely. But for everyone else, that's what I would like to see. Okay. The future for us to be, the human race, to have settlements in space and go beyond that. Oh, it would be incredible, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, space, there's so much to learn out there, isn't it? I mean, it's, 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 to me, it's like looking at the source. You know, when, when, when you see the pictures well, of space. It's exploration. It's, it's exploration. You get to go where no one's ever gone before and do things that no one has ever done before. And I'll tell you, that's what every human being, when they're young, dreams they can do. And space gives us unlimited horizons. There's no limit to that horizon. You know, it's not like the Earth where we've, we've circled the Earth. We know everything. There are no more unlimited horizons on the Earth. But you get out in space and the horizon becomes unlimited, the possibilities become unlimited, and that means people can do unlimited things wherever they go. Well, space is supposed to be ever-expanding, if you can get that concept in, in your head. I can't. Um, but let's just look at, you know, perhaps uh, visit, you know, going to Mars. Um, do you think that will be possible in our lifetime? Um, is, is that something that they are still actively working towards? Well, you know, uh, uh, Elon Musk, one of the reasons he got into the space business after PayPal, he's a space cadet. He wanted to go to Mars. He himself wanted to go to Mars, and he wanted to pay. He had a billion and a half dollars. He thought he could do it himself. He was going to start out by making a, a privately funded and built uh, science mission to go to Mars. And that's how he ended up in the rocket business, because he could build the spacecraft uh, to go to Mars, the science package. But he couldn't launch it. It was too expensive to launch. So he decided, I'll build rockets instead. His goal, though, in the end, is still to get to Mars. He's building something called the Falcon Heavy rocket. This is a rocket that's going to be the most powerful rocket built since the uh, Saturn V in the 1960s. And it'll, be able, it'll be able to put uh, 50 tons in orbit. They hope to do their first test flight sometime in the next two years. Um, if that rocket's built privately, for the price that they charge for the Falcon rockets, it's going to open up space to no, numerous customers who before could not afford to get into space. And that, in turn, will make it possible for Elon Musk to, to build spaceships that he can take elsewhere. So going to Mars, that's an inevitable. You know, it's not a question of if we'll do it. It's just a question of when and how. And the way I see us doing it is to have a very free and open competition among many different people trying to make money as they do it. Yeah. That's how the United States got built. That's really how Britain became um, what he called the British Empire really That's right. conquered the world because it became open and free and competitive and commercial. That's the best way to do it, and that's what's going on right now. It's, it's, it's incredibly exciting because oh, you, know, you can see all these. If you look at the video, I posted it on my website, Behind the Black, the actual video of today's test flight with uh, Spaceship Two, and if you watch that, it really feels like you're watching a science fiction film from the 1950s. It looks just like those kind of spaceships. But this is coming from private money. Yeah. No, one, no government built it. It wasn't conceived by the government. It wasn't funded by the government, and it isn't being built for the government. It's being built for private citizens to go to space. It's really cool. 
Do you know, I, I must admit, I, I actually stumbled across uh, NASA TV just the other day on Ustream. And, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting, you know, just the, the whole talking about space all the time. And, you, you know, I just can't get enough of it sometimes. Like, I could sit there and watch it for hours. So, um, you know, um, go ahead. Uh, you, you know, space, once again, it, always, it, it really, the reason I think it has an appeal for everyone, and especially kids, is because it does represent that unlimited unknown horizon. And human beings naturally are curious. And we want to know what and go someplace no one's ever gone before. So it appeals in us to us that way. And, it, and, and everything done right now in space, everything done is always cutting edge. It's always on the edge of the envelope. It's doing things that were never done before that are very challenging and difficult. And people like to be challenged. They like to do difficult things. And um, it's, it's how people express their humanity. And so space is that, and that's one of the reasons it doesn't appeal. Everyone goes that way. Everyone always gets excited when they look at space stuff. The government stuff, though, NASA, it, you know, I grew up in the United States where um, for the last 40 years there's been great argument, should we spend money on space? Oh, yes. It, it, when, yes. when your tax dollars are spent for it, um, people then have doubts because they don't know if their tax dollars should be spent on this thing. Britain, for example, in the 60s, the government of Britain actually passed a law that said no money will be spent on manned space exploration in Britain, and that was not repealed until about four years ago. Um, so Britain has been out of the game in terms of manned space exploration for about 50 years. Oh, I know, and I it, know. It's an expression not of an unwillingness to explore, but it's an expression of a doubt about using tax dollars to do it. Oh, do you know what? I think it, 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 it was one of no the... No one's coerced. At, it was one of the worst decisions, Robert. I... I, 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 I um, um, I, I don't know. I, for, for, for me, um, uh, you know, we should have put that money into it because, we, you know, we were just left behind. Well, in a sense, yes, but the other side is that uh, what I recognize is that there are many people have doubts about if you, did, if you don't want to go to space, why should your tax dollars be used to pay for it? But if it's privately financed and customers buy the product, then no one's being, no one's money is being taken from them involuntarily. The only ones who are paying for space are the ones who want to pay for space. That's why the private enterprise works much better. And so, yes, Britain, I think, should have participated for the last 40 years. But at the same time, um, it's questionable they would have accomplished that much in that period of time with the amount of money that they would have had available. Better that private enterprise, and that's happening now in Britain. You've got the Skylon rocket being built in Britain privately, and they want to compete on the open market against companies like SpaceX and Strata Launch to try to launch satellites and uh, cargo and humans to space and do it cheaply. And I think that's a much more effective way to do it because, once again, you're not taking any dollars from anyone who doesn't want to give it to you. You're only getting it from the customers who buy the product. And there are lots of them, so let's go do it. It's, it's the best way to do it. Okay, well, we're just coming to an ad break here, but after the ad break, I want to get into your book, The Story of Apollo 11. So stay tuned and we'll No, be... no, I have to correct you. Oh. I have to correct you. It's Apollo 8. It's oh, I Apollo do 11. apologize. I do it. Apollo 8. Well, stay tuned and we'll be right back after this break. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the Moore Show website. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The More Show. That's right. Welcome back to the show. I'm still currently joined by my guest, Robert Zimmerman, who is an award-winning science journalist and space historian. Now, uh, Robert, just before the ad break there, we were going to talk about the story of Apollo 8. Yes, this is a book that I wrote back originally in 1998. It was my first book in, in, on, uh, on space history, um, and it's just been released as an e-book, so it's available to everybody uh, electronically now. And this is really good, uh, Kevin, because uh, I put a new forward in, and in fact one of the wives of one of the astronauts added her thoughts as well as a forward. 
And we were able to actually put in all the pictures and color images from from the hardback, uh, but do it in a better way in the electronic version. And it's now released. And I wrote the story of Apollo 8 because when I was growing up in the 60s, watching the space race to get to the moon, it struck me very clearly at the time, and it was really pronounced clearly at the time, that the landing of Apollo 8 was actually not historically as important as the first mission to circle the moon, Apollo 8. Um, Apollo 8 uh, was launched on uh, December 20th, uh, 1968. It, it was three astronauts. They were going to fly to the moon, orbit the moon for 24 hours, and then return to Earth. Um, this flight was the first time humans ever left Earth orbit, ever traveled to another world. It will always be the first time humans traveled to another world. They did it Christmas week, so that they orbited the moon on Christmas Eve, uh, 1968. Um, 1968 itself was, from uh, an American perspective, uh, one of the most tumultuous years in, in, in the whole 20th century. You had uh, assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert, Robert uh, Kennedy. You had the uh, Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the whole Vietnam War situation. You had race riots in numerous cities. You had a Chicago convention in which there was rioting in the streets in terms of the presidential election. In that year, you had the Czech, um, the, the, the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union invading Prague, uh, to, uh, squelching that freedom. So a very difficult and painful year. And then at the end of the year, Apollo 8 orbits the moon. This mission also, um, in many ways, uh, won the space race because the Soviet Union kind of gave up going to the moon after, after this flight. We had won it. We had gotten there first. It, 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 the story I love to tell more than anything else about this mission, uh, it, there's so many things about it. It required a book because it really shook the nation, took the, the world, I think, especially Western civilization in the United States, yeah. took the, by the shoulders and shook us in ways that were unexpected and, and not anticipated. And uh, Apollo 11 landing was very important and very difficult and had to happen. But in many ways, I like to call it the explanation point, the period on the explanation point. It, it only finished the job that really was established by Apollo 8. Um, the story I love to tell is, uh, before the mission, the commander of the mission, Frank Borman, uh, approached the flight director, uh, Chris Kraft, and said to him, that, look, my wife, Susan, is really, really terrified about this mission. She needs reassurance. Tell her that we really have dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, and we're going to be as safe as possible, and I'm going to come home. So Chris Kraft, who was a friend to Susan Borman, the Bormans, went to visit her, and they sat down and they talked. And Chris Kraft told Susan, look, we've got it all together. We really think this mission has a really good chance. And to reassure her, to reassure her, he told her, look, we're going to the moon, and we think we have a 50-50 chance of success. They flew to the moon in 1968 thinking there was only a 50% chance of success. On top of that, this mission flew without a lunar module. The module was not ready yet. The lunar module was always planned as a redundant lifeboat. In fact, on Apollo 13, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. The Apollo 13 capsule service module had a failure. They lost all its oxygen, and it was the oxygen on the lunar module that brought them, the astronauts home. One of those astronauts on Apollo 13 was Jim Lovell. He flew also on Apollo 8. Had the same thing happened on Apollo uh, Eight that happened on Apollo 13, Jim Lovell would have been dead in five minutes. They did not have a lunar module backup. This mission flew with a expected 50% chance of, of failure, and they did it anyway. Wow. And they were 100% successful. Finally, Kevin, the most important thing about that mission is, in lunar orbit, uh, on Christmas Eve, they had a telecast with a television camera to the world. And these three astronauts... And this is a really interesting story. You have to read the book, though, to hear the whole story. Yes. They made the decision to read the first 12 verses from Genesis, the Bible, while orbiting the moon. Oh, right, right. And yeah. they did yeah. that. And they did that, uh, Kevin, because they wanted to be as, as express as much goodwill to as many people as possible. And they wanted to capture the majesty of the moment in the most effective way possible. And it's an amazing moment 
in human history. And it, it, it's a significant thing. And I, I wrote a book about it because I thought this had, the, the story had to be told properly. Well, well, absolutely. So, you know, really, um, we only just made it back and forth to the moon, didn't we, on some of these missions. I mean, do, do you think that's one of the reasons why this space program slowed down as well? Um, the Apollo missions were basically a political stunt by the United States to beat the Soviet Union in space. Kennedy said it very clearly, we stand for freedom, and we want to demonstrate that freedom and capitalism can do it better than a government communist system. It was, though, a government program. And so we did get to the moon, but once we made that achievement and we conquered the, um, uh, the moon and we won the space race, it became then very difficult to get funding through the government, as I talked about in the previous segment, um, to continue exploration. Because there was, you, you weren't doing it because of profit, you were doing it because of government fiat, de- de- declaration, command. And that never works very effectively. Apollo 8 was significant, though, because it did demonstrate that a free nation could do this very effectively and better than anyone else, because the whole space program in the 60s in the United States was essentially not NASA. It was private companies that NASA hired to build the components. The lunar module was built by Grumman. Um, The Apollo capsule was built by North American. This was not government-built. This was privately built, Um, because at that time, NASA saw itself as the customer. It bought the product. It, it designed the mission, but it got private companies, hired private companies to build the parts for it. It, was until, it wasn't until after the Apollo landings. Uh, there were only six. Uh, a dozen men walked on the moon. They probably saw less territory on those six missions than a uh, London cab driver sees in one day's work. <laughs> um, but in that period of time, those were the six missions. Then NASA decided they were no longer going to be the customer. NASA decided it's a government agency. They were going to run the show. They were going to dictate the terms. They were going to design the rockets. They were going to design what we were going to explore. Of course, there was very little enthusiasm for that. And we spent four decades not getting a lot accomplished because of it. Do you think as well um, that um, with the current International Space Station, um, do you think that's, that's playing a vital role in, in, in a lot of the experiments that they're holding up there right now? Well, okay, I wrote my, uh, one of my other books is called Leaving Earth, and that whole book is a history of manned space flight post-Apollo, and it's, it focuses very particularly on the work that's been done on space stations, because there's been a problem with every space station, the United States especially has built, but sometimes with Russia as well, and specifically with the International Space Station, that the politics interferes and they don't build the station for what it's really designed for. A space station, at our present knowledge, is nothing more than a prototype interplanetary spaceship. If you're going to put humans in space for a long period of time, six months, the only reason you're doing it right now is you're trying to figure out how to build a ship that can get you to and from Mars safely. Yeah. And that's what we should be focusing in, in the space station right now, 100%. And in fact, there are now plans to do a year-long mission on the International Space Station to test the medical and um, uh, engineering t- problems that might come up on a long mission to visit or fly past Mars. That's what it should be used for. And uh, unfortunately, that has not been the case up to now. Do you, th- do you think it will be a uh, private government, private or government that that makes it to Mars? I mean, uh, 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 Barack was, was you know hinting towards um, putting more uh, money into that program, but I mean, nothing sort of happened has it so far. I think that uh, it's going to be private that's going to make it happen. Uh, you know, when you do it with profit, it doesn't cost you a dime. Elon Musk, it hasn't cost him a dime to no, build Dragon true, and Falcon true. 9. It hasn't cost him, literally him, a dime. His customers have paid for it. So if you make a profit, it hasn't cost you any money. You have extra money. You've made a profit. You can funnel some of the profit into your company to uh, improve your designs, come up with a better ship. And that's exactly what these companies, all these companies are doing. When Virgin Galactic starts to fly tourists, they're going to funnel the profits from that a portion of their profits into the company to make better ships and more sophisticated, capa- with more sophisticated capabilities. So yes, I think in the end it will be private enterprise that will make it possible to go to space. Now it might be a government that hires these private companies to do it because the government decides we need to be there first. 
But the government's not going to design it. If they try to design it, we're going to be what we've had for the last 40 years. You know, NASA, uh, since the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, when they launched the shuttle, they spent about, about $15 billion dollars on shuttle replacements, the next generation spaceship that would replace the shuttle. Of those $15 billion, they never got past, really, blueprints. They just spent money on blueprints. $15 billion worth of blueprints. Those are really expensive blueprints. I think the government is not a way to do this. It's private enterprise, and I think that it's being shown right now, today, by Virgin Galactic, just their flight alone. It, it's, it, that's the way it's going to happen. Uh, private enterprise and freedom is always the way to make it work. Uh, absolutely. And um, which country do you think is going to be the the next country to land back on the, uh, land a man back on the moon? Well, that's a very good question. It's a little hard to say right now. Uh, you know, you do have a, uh, a burgeoning space industry in India. You have one in China. You got Russia. It hasn't quit. Europe still wants to play the game, and then you've got the United States, but the United States, of course, has an advantage of all the others. We've got a myriad and multiple companies pushing to do this. We're not just one national program anymore. We actually are free enterprise and private companies competing. So which of those is going to get there first? I can't answer the question right now. Uh, uh, if, if I had to make uh, a decision, I think that the profits from tourism that we'll, we'll be seeing over the next five years will help fund private enterprise, and you can see a private tourism mission being the next thing that happens. Um, there, are, there's what, there are two private companies that actually offer seats to go to the moon right now. There's one company, Space Adventure, they've sent the ones, they've been the ones that have been sending tourists up to ISS. They have actually have on their manifest, you can buy a ticket to fly around the moon and come back. Uh, uh, they have one customer who's already put a deposit on. They say they can't fly the mission until they get two customers. They've been trying to get the second customer. That's one mission. There's another company that is actually, they, they just can't, can't, uh, established themselves just about a month or two ago, about four months ago. Um, they, or, or they want to establish a la- uh, tourist missions landing on the moon. Now, this is very ambitious. I think that it's going to be difficult, but I think that in the end, uh, it is a private enterprise that's eventually going to do this because people want to go. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's, it's incredible the amount of money out there to, you know, for people to be able to afford this. I mean, there are some wealthy people out there as well. Um, well. Kevin, if you earned enough money and had enough spare cash, would you spend it to go to, to, go to space? Oh, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's the first reaction most people have. Uh, most people, not everyone. Yeah. Um, but it's exciting. You want to oh. do something really great. And so there are a lot of wealthy people in the world who want to do that. It would be an, um, one of the pivotal points in your life, wouldn't it, to, to just, just be part of that process? I mean, wow, you know. Um, but, you know, China, um, obviously, you know, they have their own ambitions and own space program, which they, they, they're fully, you know, they're moving forward with. Um, uh, uh, we've not mentioned China. Uh, uh, surely they're in the race China has an interesting program. It's essentially modeled after the Soviet Union's program in the 60s. And it's, it's, in many ways, I think in the long run, it's going to have the same effect, the same influences. It's a very, it, the difference is it's not in a space race with the United States, so they can take their time. And that's essentially what they're doing. They're doing maybe one mission every two years. It's a very uh, uh, leisurely pace. At the pace they're setting, they will eventually get to the moon, but it's going to probably be about a century from now. They're not in any rush. They don't have to be in any rush. They're developing a space station right now. They've got a prototype small station in orbit. They're going to do their second flight to it very soon, sometime this summer, I think. Um, They're eventually going to start assembling a larger space station in orbit, much like the Russians did with their Mir space right. station. They're going to be focusing that space station, much like Mir was. It is a prototype interplanetary spaceship. It is not a uh, laboratory to do um, chemical research. It's, it's to learn how to build us interplanetary spaceships, and they know that. So they're working that way. And so eventually they're going to be, I think, a player in space. But their pace is very slow, and when you compare what, what private enterprise can do down the road with profit, they're going to be behind, I think, in the end. I don't think they're going to, be, they're going to have to pick up the pace and be more competitive. Right now, they don't have to compete very aggressively, but I think as the, as the competition heats up, 
I like to say that I'm behind the black with each of these new stories. The competition is heating up. Uh, as this competition heats up, I think China's going to feel the heat, and they're going to want to be in the game, and they're going to pick up their pace quite significantly. Now, one of the subjects I wanted to touch on as well, and, and I'm conscious of an ad, ad break coming up uh, close here, is the, 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 the sort of sad state of, the, uh, of, of, of climate science. Um, you, know, it, you know, is the climate getting warmer, um, and how does that affect um, you know, the sort of space race in a, in a sense? You know, it's completely separate from space. You know, I'm a science writer. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about this until or wait until after the break. Um, but I'm a science writer, and my my writing is is in a variety of ways. I write a lot about science and astronomy and space exploration. My books generally have been history of space exploration, um, but I do write about uh, uh, the situation of climate science. Right. And, uh, because I care about good science, I write about this at length because I think that the field of science has been badly corrupted in the field of climate, and it's it's been it's hurt it's hurt Western civilization significantly. It's hurt the reputation of science badly. Now, if you want to go into much greater detail after the break, I'd rather wait till. I, I would rather do that because you know. there's a lot to talk about there, and I think we've we've just scratched the surface. So, stay tuned, and we'll be right back after this. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff. You're now watching The More Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm still joined here with Robert Zimmerman, an award-winning science journalist and space historian. Uh, Robert, welcome back to the final section of the show. Thank you very much, Kevin, for having me. I hope I haven't blown you away with my (laughs) breath. Do you know what? I've found you so, so interesting. Um, it's nice to, to speak to someone who's, uh, you've, got, you've got a lot of energy, I can, I can tell that, and, and uh, you're so passionate about, about what, you, what you do, and it, that's, that comes across so lovely. Do you know that? Well, I've always believed uh, that one should uh, uh, put, put your, you know, your heart and soul into everything you do. That's the way it works. That's how people succeed. That's the best way to do things. And so yes. That's what I do. Yes, and I, I hear you there, and uh, I'm, I'm going to get I'm going to get you back on um, because there's there's some of your other books that I'd like to discuss as well, and also uh, just to keep us up to date on what's going on in in the in the space field as well. Oh, you know, I think that uh, the general public needs to be aware of this because the future is is what's in space. I mean, that is the future, and it, it's an interesting thing about space. One of the things I've noticed in my book writing is is the influence of how a nation chooses to go to space influences that country significantly. And I can give two examples. This is one of the things that Leaving Earth was all about. Um, uh, the Soviet Union had its government command system on how to go to space. And the United States was supposed to be free enterprise. But in a sense, the United States copied the Soviet Union, and that has badly influenced the United States for the last 40 years. We've tried to actually copy the Soviet Union. We won the Cold War, and in the process, we decided to copy the Soviet Union. It's very weird. But in Russia, they decided to make their space program capital as a capitalist program, a profit-making operation, very early in the game. Yeah. Uh, when the Soviet Union was falling apart, they decided we can make money from this product. This is actually a product that we can sell on the open market. And they, it was a good product. It was one of the few things out of the old Soviet Union that was a good product. And in many ways, their space program taught that nation how to, how to be capitalists. And it led them forward to a free capitalist society. It's fascinating. And in the United States now, we're beginning to shift back into capitalism when it comes to space exploration. And it might actually help influence the nation again to return to its roots in freedom and capitalism. And and that's an interesting thing about space that is weird, uh, that not only is it the cutting edge of exploration and human endeavor, but it seems to have some influence culturally way beyond uh, its its exploration uh, roots. Abs- absolutely, and um, you know, just before the break, there we were talking about the um, the, the climate science. So, so let, let's just sort of you know uh, 
go off from where we where we left. And um, so, so you know, you're quite passionate about this, aren't you? Well, I care very much about the integrity of science. Science, like uh, engineering, you can't achieve anything if you're not cruelly, bluntly, uh, heartlessly honest about everything you do. And you challenge everything brutally, honestly about everything you do. Because, you know, if you don't do that right, look, engineering, if you don't do it right, people will die. Uh, they'll die going to the moon. You've got to get it right. And yeah. the same thing applies to science. You have to get it right. And you have to, if you're a good scientist, you're skeptical about everything all the time. And one of the things that's really disturbed me increasingly over the last two decades is how the field of climate science has been corrupted and has shifted from good skeptical science challenging everything to uh, being badly influenced by politics and controlled by politics and warping the science very, very poorly. Um, and look, let's, let's start out right with some basic facts. We know without question the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. Right. That much we know. There's no doubt it's increasing, and fossil fuels are almost certainly the cause of that. But that's the end of our knowledge. The climate is an extremely complicated thing. I've spent the last decade as a science writer researching the field. And the conclusion I come up with is that if you really look at it honestly, they are nowhere near uh, uh, knowledgeable enough to predict what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. For example, carbon dioxide is really a trace gas in our atmosphere. The most important global warming uh, component in the atmosphere is water followed by nitrogen. And these are much, much more important on establishing what the climate's going to be. Carbon dioxide is a very tiny component there. The amount it's increasing still makes it a very tiny component. And the climate scientists have recognized this from the start. Every climate model that's been put forth that says carbon dioxide is going to cause the climate to warm doesn't say it's carbon dioxide doing it. They say that what's going to happen is carbon dioxide is going to combine with other factors that are going to feed back to the climate, and those other factors, because of the increase in carbon dioxide, those other factors are going to be what causes the climate to warm. Now, in the last, up until around 98, the climate was was warming. In fact, for the last 200 plus years, 500 plus years, it's been warming. The last 20 years, though, it has stopped warming. The Met Office in the U.K. has admitted to this fact that, that in the last 18 or so years, there's been no appreciable increase in the climate temperature. Yet, every climate model uh, by the climate scientists who advocate global warming as a, as a problem we have to deal with, yeah. every single climate model um, has said that the climate temperature is going to rise in lockstep with the increasing carbon dioxide. So every one of those models is wrong. Those models are computer models, garbage in, garbage out. They, are, they don't have enough information yet to tell us what's really going on, and what we've now learned is that the climate models are wrong. And, and how, how um, does this... So how is the climate that... getting warmer? It's not yeah. clear at this point. There are, Kevin, also enormous other factors that we just do not know much about that influence our climate. Um, the sun could be a very significant factor. For example, the reason it might be getting warmer the last 500-some years is we were coming out of something called the Little Ice Age in the 1600s, which there's circumstantial evidence that suggests that was caused by the sun and the sun's activity. And if the sun's activity dims over the next 50 to 100 years, we could see a cooling trend. But we don't know that. This is, I'm not speculating here. The, the, so I have a very big problem in the climate field with a lot of scientists making definitive statements of certainty about what they know about the climate and what's going to happen, when the truth of the matter is, is they do not know yet. And they, if you dig deep into their papers, you find out they admit that, but they won't do it publicly. And it, it bothers me a lot as a science journalist, too, Kevin, because I see a lot of science journalists buying into the agenda of a lot of um, uh, global warming scientists who want to push for um, um, uh, legal, legal laws and uh, environmental regulations. Uh, and a lot of uh, journalists buy into that without really knowing the field very well or studying it very well. So I care a great deal about this. No, absolutely, and I, and, I, and I can tell that with the way that you come across, and um, you know, it, you know, it is an important. Uh, it, well, it's important to the entire state of science, isn't it? Basically, 
Yes, I mean, if you start to, if you cannot, you know, there's been outright fraud in the science, in, in the climate field. There have been cases now documented of climate scientists who believe in global warming fudging their data and hiding that fact to, to promote their agenda, their belief that the climate is getting warmer. There's evidence of temperature gauges being fudged. Been, been adjusted. Mm. There's evidence of climate uh, data being adjusted to create the illusion of a warming. That fraud, what upsets me most about that isn't so even the climate field specifically. What upsets me about that is the loss of trust the, uh, that the science field is, uh, is uh, being hit with by this, this fraud. Because the one thing that science had going for it since Galileo is that as a field, you could trust a scientist to tell you the truth, that, they, that their whole, the whole field depended on absolute honesty and integrity and not fudging your data. And if the public loses faith in science, then what happens then? You have a situation where you don't, you, the good research is going to be difficult to track down or to even do because no one believes what people are telling them. And this is the area that really upsets me more than anything else because uh, the science, and it upsets me most in the field of science itself because the fraud that's been revealed in the climate field, the science, climate field, has, the scientists in that field have not uh, cleaned house. They no. have circled their wagons and tried to protect the bad guys. It's, you know, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. And in this case, a cover-up is, going to, is doing them far more harm than if they just simply cleaned house. Absolutely. And, um, you know, your work is so varied, though, isn't it? And um, um, I'm sure I heard you on Coast many years ago, uh, you know, talking about the, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, yes. And I wrote a book on the Hubble Space. That's Hubble right. Space. That's right. I'm pretty sure it was you that that, that I was listening to. I, I, I remember listening back to the interview, thinking, "Wow, that was that was interesting." And um, you know, with with the Hubble Space Telescope, um, there's replacement, isn't isn't there? Soon to be, are they, they're working on. No. Is that right? Though there isn't. No. Oh, no. I thought no. there was. No, the Hubble Space Telescope is an optical general observatory in space. Um, there is no effort right now to build an optical general observatory in space. None. The only telescope that NASA lyingly, they lied, have been calling the replacement for the Hubble Space Telescope is the James Webb Space Telescope. That's the, the one. James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. It has been optimized and designed to do deep space cosmology, to look back towards the Big Bang. And to do that, you need to be in the infrared because of the red shift of light. The farther away you go, the more the light shifts into the red. You go far enough away, everything's in the infrared, and so you need an infrared telescope to study early cosmology. Now, that's nothing wrong with studying in, uh, early cosmology. I'm all in favor of it. But it is a lie to say the James Webb Telescope is replacing Hubble. It is not. There is no plan in the works right now, zero plan, to replace the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990. It yep. finally got up to full capacity in 1993. It's had numerous maintenance missions that have basically rebuilt the telescope. It has no instrument in it that was launched with it in 1990. It's a state-of-the-art instrument as of uh, uh, four years ago when yep. the last servicing mission took place. Um, but when those instruments now fail, there will be no way to repair it. Um, it was originally designed to only fly 15 years. It's now been up 23 years. Um, there is, in many ways, no reason why it can't go on for many more years. Um, but uh, there is no plans to replace it right now, Kevin. Zero. We must be honest about that. Well, isn't that very sad? I mean, you look at the amazing <laughs> pictures that it's taken. <laughs> I wrote a whole book on the subject, Universe in the Mirror. I mean, it's, it's a great tragedy, and it's a great, tra it's a great story. I wrote, I wrote it. How did this happen? And in many ways, the astronomy community was to blame for it. Um, uh, they themselves dug this grave. Uh, they themselves uh, regret the situation enormously. A large number of them are very unhappy that they are stuck with the James Webb Telescope, which, by the way, has gone so much over budget. Um, its original budget was going to be a billion and a half dollars. It's now costing close to $9 billion. That's what is that, almost six times the, uh, uh, the cost. Um, and that might be more. That it is eating up the entire astronomy budget of NASA so that no other space telescope missions can be built or flown. 
And that's literally what's happened. Um, uh, the, after Hubble got launched in 90, the 90s were a golden age, even into the aughts, a golden age of astronomy and space. And enormous discoveries were made. And they were fed by the optical images that Hubble produced that were then followed up by infrared, by gamma ray, by X-ray observations with other telescopes. But there are no plans in the works to replace Hubble, and there's no money to replace Hubble right now. And when Webb is launched, then they'll start to finally talk about coming up with a replacement. But nothing in the works right now. And it's a terrible tragedy. We have to cross our fingers that Hubble will stay operating for many more decades to come. It's, it's hard to see. There are ground-based telescopes that are being built right now, Kevin, that are very gigantic. The extremely large uh, telescope that Europe is building is going to be have a, have a mirror that's like... Uh, what is it, I think, 35 meters across. It's gigantic. Wow. You know, several uh, 120 some odd feet. It's just bigger than a football field. In many ways, it will be able to do some of the comparable work to Hubble, but uh, you, you, there's no ground-based telescope can do the kind of uh, the wide range of work with as much flexibility and with as much speed as an optical telescope in space. And so we're going to be kind of crippled when it comes to astronomy over the next couple of days. Oh, I think it's going to be a sad day when, when Hubble does eventually become offline. Um, you know, like I said before, just for the sheer amount of amazing uh, uh, photography that it's taken, and it's just it's given us a glimpse into just some corners of, 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 our, of our amazing galaxy. And um, um, You know, uh, Kevin... Uh, uh, my website is called Behind the Black, yeah. and uh, the reason I have that title for it is, in many ways, by what both Hubble and the astronauts have done. Because when you look up in space, when you're in space, the sky is black. Yes. What's behind the black? And Hubble and the astron uh, astronauts that have flown to space and looked at the universe more closely than we've ever seen it before have given us that first glimpse of what's behind the black out there. And uh, it's only a glimpse. It's only a tiny glimpse. You know, right now we've only had Hubble, one telescope up there, That's right. working full time for 23 years. It can hardly see anything. The universe is so vast. Uh, and we've had, as I said, you know, you had 12 astronauts walk on the moon. They saw less than a cab driver in, in <laughs> London in one day. Um, so uh, we've seen only a glimpse of what the universe holds for us. And it, 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 there's so much more glorious things out there that are awaiting our discovery. It's just a matter of time and effort and human endeavor. Yeah, a, a discovery is probably beyond our conceptualization, probably. Well, you know, um, uh, what it is, I think Arthur Clarke said, when a scientist says something is difficult, it, it'll just take a little longer. When he says it's impossible, he's lying. <laughs> uh, it's hard to cons uh, visualize what no one has ever seen before. What a great that's quote! That's exactly the whole point of everything we do. That's exactly the whole point. Um, mm. Ly Ly Lyman Spitzer, the guy who conceived the Hubble Space Telescope, when he first proposed it in 1946, he said the main reason to do it is to think, see things we've never seen before and have couldn't conceive. And you know what? That's exactly what Hubble allowed us to do. Uh, because we, for the first time in the history of the human race, we were able to put on glasses and see the universe sharply, clearly, and uh, with clarity. And uh, uh, the universe, our perception of the universe has fundamentally changed since Hubble was launched in 1993. Uh, was was fixed in 1993. Yes, yes. And and w where do you see your work taking you as well? I mean, um, you know, you've you've done these some fantastic books. Um, and of course, you know, you you know the story of Apollo 8, You know. Um, one of the newest, but um, what, what's on the horizon? Well, you know, uh, one of the reasons I created Behind the Black is because the publishing industry is changing. Yes. And uh, I'm focusing more and more on web-based work uh, to make a living. And uh, it allows me to, I don't have to find an editor who approves my work. I can go ahead and write it, and I post on Behind the Black all the time when important things happen. And uh, uh, that's where I am right now. Uh, future books, uh, they always happen. It's just a matter of time. Uh, uh, my, my, my right now, though, I, I really am enjoying. I write for you know many science magazines still, uh, but I'm really enjoying the ability to write about uh, the events of the day, especially in the field of science and space, uh, on my website. Okay, and and just again, just plug your websites, please, just just for the audience listening. Yes, uh, the website is called BehindTheBlack.com, uh, and obviously if you do a search for Behind the Black and Zimmerman, you'll get it in two seconds. 
uh, and I post there uh, every day. Uh, if anything, I try to keep, uh, use it as a vehicle to keep people up to date on what's going on in science and space. But there's some politics involved and uh, cultural things that I think are important that will affect the ability of the human race to explore space and push the unknown. I mean, if, for example, if the United States goes bankrupt yes. from an overpowering uh, federal government uh, hmm. that's uh, spending every penny it can find, yeah. then we won't be able to accomplish much of anything. So that's a factor in how uh, in what I report and what I write about. Well, it's a very delicate situation, isn't it? Yes, I, 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 absolutely. But there's a like you said, there's lots of factors, and uh, you've blown my mind. I thought you might do a little bit. Um, you know, uh, we, we've scratched the surface of your work, I feel, right? So I would love to get you back on. I mean, my pleasure, Kevin, anytime. Okay, well, we will be back on Wednesday. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about the show, just go to themoreshow.co.uk. So until next time, thanks for joining us. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website.